Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Welcome to my New Year's Eve special for 2021. Have you been enjoying my reviews and Freestyle Friday videos of late? If you haven't been watching those farming practices videos, please be sure to check them out. What a year we've had. I've had some personal and professional successes this past year, and I hope you have also. I'm looking forward to next year bringing even more success to all of us. Today's show is another mixture of free samples and wines I purchased. Having sparkling wine is always a fun way to celebrate any occasion, even if it's just because you're alive another day. Let's get started, shall we? First is the Domaine Bousquet, Brute, if you watched last week's Christmas special, then you've already seen my review of the rosé version of the, of the wine and have also heard the history of the winery. The super short version is that this winery was founded by Jean Bousquet in 1997. He came from the Carcassonne area of southwest France where he had a winery. He decided to open, open the winery after a vacation to Argentina, as in this winery. It's located in the Tupangato region of the Uco Valley, south of Mendoza. One thing to note is that this wine uses what is known as the Charmat method. That means the second fermentation that produces the bubbles occurs in a tank rather than a bottle like the Champagne method. It has the advantage of being able to naturally produce a sparkling wine in a faster, less expensive way. Many delicious sparklers are made this way. I do have a preference for Méthode Traditionnelle or Champagne method, but it's not always econom economically viable. It just depends on the region and the winery. Either way, both can make super tasty and fun wines. Here are the stats for the wine. The non-vintage Domaine Bousquet Charmat Brut suggested retail price is $13. It's from the Guatiari Valley, Tupangato, Uco Valley, Mendoza, Argentina. 75% Chardonnay, 25% Pinot Noir. That's a flip from the Rosé from last week. It's a certified organic vineyard made with organic grapes. This is different than 100% organic but it does require 100% organic grapes. Please see my Freestyle Friday episodes on organic farming practices and wine. The elevation is 1,200 meters or 3,900 feet. The soil is gravel and sand. The ABV is 12%. The total acidity is 6 grams per liter, and the pH is 3.3. The RS is 9.5 grams per liter. The back label, the back label has this listed as AZ, which stands for azucar, or span, which is Spanish for sugar. Next, we have a treat, some sparkling wine from Portugal, vintage too. It comes from the Caves Transmontanes winery. I got this wine from one of those offers on Underground Cellar back in 2018. As a matter of fact, I got two of those bottles. I've been so looking forward to trying this wine. I have an extra bottle after this. The, this winery is located in the Simu Korgu region of the Douro. The Douro region of Portugal is most famous for port wines. And yes, I'm trying to do the proper Portuguese pronunciation. So if this doesn't sound familiar, but you know the words I'm saying, this is why, because Portuguese is not pronounced like Spanish. Anyway, they have also been gaining popularity with non-fortified wines, also known as regular wines. Notably red, but also white. Sparkling isn't as well known from this area. The winery was founded in 1989 by Joom Cavio Maya, a Doru producer that traveled to Napa in the early 1980s to learn more about production methods there. While there, he worked at Schramsberg Vineyards arguably, in my opinion, one of the best producers of American Champagne Method wines. Jaum invited the owner of Schramsberg, Jack Davies, to the Doru to judge its potential for sparkling wines. After a few years testing different grapes in different regions in Portugal, 
they decided that the Simu Korgu region of the Doru was the ideal area to make champagne method sparkling wines. The vineyards sit atop the peaks of the region with an altitude of 550 meters or about 1800 feet. The name of the wine, Vertici, refers to being at the top of these mountains as it means vertex in English. The wind here is too cold for the production of port wines, but are just right for sparkling wines. Quality, wine, spark, quality sparkling wine relies on grapes retaining a natural acidity, otherwise they become too flabby to produce that crisp and bright bubbly. There are different ways to ensure this. Most grapes for sparkling wine of all types are harvested earlier than they would normally be harvested for still wines. Altitude and climate also play a factor in getting high quality grapes for this process. The Champagne region of France has a marginal climate for growing grapes, though for the past 20 years it's become easier uh, and there is genuine concern that they may need to adjust their harvest dates to be even earlier and introduce new grape varieties to ensure higher acidity with acceptable maturity. But you don't need to be that far north or that far south in the southern hemisphere to be able to make this type of wine, just the right conditions. That gets more difficult the closer to the equator you get, but it's still possible. Anyway, after this partnership, the winery was established. I'm not sure if it was just a working partnership or if Schramsberg is a partial owner. It seems like Jack Davies acted more as a consultant than having any financial gain. Since the founding of the winery, Celso Pereira is the wine, main winemaker. He also worked at Schramsberg early on. Pedro Guedes joined in 2002. They make six traditional method sparkling wines, but also have a red and a white still wine. With all that said, I don't know if, they're, if they are still around. I mean, the website is still up, so someone's paying the bills. But as far as this wine is concerned, I can't find anything past this vintage. The other wines have later vintages, but it's not like they've got like an 18 or a 19 on the website that I could find. Or maybe I just didn't look hard enough. One more thing before we get into the stats of the wine. This wine and the next both indicate a disgorgement date, the month and year the bottle was disgorged before putting the regular cork in the bottle. Now, all wines in this method will undergo second fermentation in the bottle, but most wines will have a crown cap on the bottle rather than a cork. That's the same kind of crown cap used for a beer. During this time, the lees are in the bottle, adding complexity and mouthfeel to the wine. In addition to that, the lees are able to absorb any oxygen coming into the bottle. The crown caps aren't completely airtight. It's been speculated that lees can absorb oxygen for as long as 50 years. And once the bottle is disgorged and the specialized sparkling wine cork is inserted, a more traditional style of aging happens, the slow oxidation of the wine. The lees effectively protect the wine from oxidation. So the later disgorgement date, the fresher the wine will be compared to the same vintage disgorged at an earlier date. Neither is necessarily better, just different. Knowing this disgorgement date can be helpful to the consumer as to getting a preview as to how the wine will taste. Event essentially, having this information will let the consumer know the true maturity of the wine. It's also speculated that a champagne method wine will last as many years as it aged on the lees after disgorgement. This is important for both vintage and non-vintage sparkling wines. In the case of a vintage wine, you'll have the complete picture of aging on and off the lees. For non-vintage wines, it can give you an approximate vintage for the base wine. Champagne and some other regions specify the minimum time on lees for all wines, vintage and non-vintage. That can be anywhere from nine months to 60 months, depending on the region, any age designation like Reserva or Grand Reserva, or other quality designations. 30 to 36 months is the most common with a few up to 60 months for the top quality designation. In many cases, in all regions, producers will regularly age on the lees longer, especially longer than required, especially for vintage wines. Champagnes and other wines made in the same way will have a base wine from one year and then a blending of other wines intentionally held back, many times required by law sometimes as many as 20 plus years prior. For non-vintage, that helps ensure a consistency of style. For vintage, that just allows the winemaker to use back vintages to add complexity to the wine. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's get to the stats for this wine. 
the 2008 Caves Transmontanas Verchasi Goveyu. It's a brute. It's normally 36 bucks, but I paid $29 on Underground Cellar. It's from the Vino Espamante do Douro DOC in the Simu Corgu region of the Douro. It's 100% Goveyu. This is the local name for Godelu, though there is another one called Goveyu Heiau. It is 550 meters or 1,800 feet in elevation. The soil is granite. It's age on the lees 84 months or seven years. The disgorgement date was October 2016. The ABV is 12%. The total acidity is 7.34 grams per liter. The pH is 2.96. And the residual sugar or RS or dosage is 4 grams per liter, which means it's brute. On to our final wine. If you've been watching my show for the last few years, then this one should be very familiar. The return of Bruno Payard's wine. In 2019, I had the pleasure of meeting Bruno and his daughter Elise during my visit to Provine. I also got to interview Bruno, so you should watch that episode. The link's in the description below. Even though I've had this wine on the show on like three or four times by now, I'll give you the medium version of the history and other information about them. So Bruno Payard comes from a family of brokers and growers in Champagne dating back to 1704. He decided that he wanted to make his own Champagne instead of being a broker of it. So in 1981, at the age of 27, he started his company with only the money he had from selling his old Jaguar. First, he worked with many growers throughout the region to supply grapes to him. Now, beginning in 1994, he started purchasing his own vineyards. He currently owns 32 hectares of vineyards, which include 12 of the 17 Grand Cru regions of Champagne. These vineyards supply more than half of the grapes for his production. The rest he still gets from those same growers he's been working with since the beginning. His daughter Elise joined him in 2007 and then became the CEO in 2018. Bruno Payard was the first champagne house to include the disgorgement date on every bottle of wine they produce. In the past, only the Prestige Cuvée or the Tête du Cuvée from a champagne house would have this, and not everyone did it back then from what I, get, from what I gather. The Tête du Cuvée is the top bottling of a champagne house. Think Dom Perignon from Moet and Chandon. They also employ sustainable farming practices. They don't use herbicides or pesticides. They incorporate cover crops, which helps with weed control. And they only use certified organic fertilizers, plus many other aspects of sustainability in the vineyard. This is Bruno Parard's Premier Cuvée, the house's entry-level wine, if you want to call it that. But don't let that fool you into thinking it's not a high-quality wine. I mean, to me, there is no such thing as bad champagne. That doesn't mean some aren't better than others to each of us, just that there's a minimum level of quality for, champ for champagne, for champagne, in my opinion. I will add that I've experienced more entry-level champagnes that are essentially bulk or leftover juice that's probably made by a large house but sold off as a private label at a lower cost. Even those will be very good quality. Like all non-vintage champagne, this one is made from multiple vintages. Each house has its own take on that. In the case of Bruno Payard, this wine has 35% reserve wine, wine that is from various earlier vintages. This is done in a Solera style, like sherry, where new vintages are added each year to older vintages in barrel. This Solera has wine from as far back as 1985. And the grapes come from 35 of the 320 crews of champagne. In many ways, champagnes like this are an expression of the entire region rather than a singular place. Each house then puts its own spin on it. One thing that sets Bruno Payard apart from the other houses is that he prefers to make his champagne extra brut or lower. Now this refers to the RS or really the final dosage of the wine. In Champagne and many other places that follow their sweetness scale, extra brut is a maximum of six grams per liter of residual sugar. This is the same keeping to Bruno's philosophy of having a purity in his champagne. Okay, let's get the stats of this wine. The non-vintage Bruno Payard Premier Cuvée. The suggested retail price is 60 bucks. It's from Champagne. The house is in Rons. It's 35% Reserve Solara. It's a blend of 25 vintages with the first year being 1985. It is 45% Pinot Noir, 33% Chardonnay, and 22% Meunier. 36 months on the lees. Now, non-vintage only requires 15 months. So 
and 36 is the minimum for a vintage champagne. Six months post-disgorgement aging to allow the wine to rest prior to release. The disgorgement was June in 2020. The ABV is 12%. The RS is less than six grams per liter, so extra brute. All right, enough talk. Let's drink some wine. All right, so I've been recording. It's been shortened, but I've been recording for over half an hour. So these wines are definitely uh, warmer than they were out of the fridge. I did pull them out right before I started recording. So they were pretty cold. And I'm just going to destroy these these uh, foils here. All right. So I'm going to open all three wines and then I'll pour them just like I did for the Christmas episode. Now, kids, you really want to be careful when you open these bottles. You don't want to point at anybody. This one's really hard to get out the cork out. But you definitely want to keep the... Um, your thumb on that at all times. Now, I can remember quite a few years ago during one of these specials where I was going to record, I I took the cage off of of like, I don't know, I had to think at least one sparkling wine, maybe I had more than one, and I just kind of left it on the table, on this table, and we're going to use the little thingy. That doesn't always work, by the way. It, in, the, in my exam, I have to actually cut the foil. But for about, the cage was off for like a good five, 10 minutes or whatever. And yes, eventually the cork just flew out and the chandelier that's like right there, luckily it didn't break anything. Like it didn't, you know, there's like gla there's like little glass panels on the side and then, you know, the bulbs. So luckily the, the cork didn't break anything, but it scared the bejesus out of me. All right. So let's see if I can get this one not to make a lot of noise. Now, that's what it's supposed to be. I mean, a little bit of a pop-up from the first one isn't that big of a deal. But, you know, when you're doing your exam, I'm going to try to use a little tab again on this. Sometimes you can't find the tab. It's there. It's just not easily accessible. When you're doing your exam, kids, if you're one of my SOM buddies... You know, the, 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 the foil can be a real pain in the butt to get off. Just don't get nervous. I mean, it, it's hard to get, not get nervous during the exam, but, you know, if you're taking the certified, you will always do, you will always use sparkling wine service. You won't be doing decanting service. When you do your certified, and sorry, when you do your advanced, and when you do your master sommelier exam, you will do both, and you will make a cocktail, so... Alrighty, so enough of that. Throw that over there. Let's pour some sparklers. Also for your exam, uh, when you're pouring all the wine, we're pouring the wine to all of your uh, all of your uh, guests at the table, which will there'll be only only like maybe two people, and then you know two to six imaginary people. The pour needs to be exactly the same for all the glasses. So let's see how I did. And granted, I had the I had the luxury of having a line on the on the uh, glasses. I'm a little short on on the Bruno here. I can tell already. It's hard to tell with with the uh, with the bubbles, but yeah, I hit almost the seventy five. I'm, little, I'm right on the 75, a little short of the 75 in this one, and I'm right about the 75 milliliter line on this lot, on this glass. Okay, enough of that BSing. Let's get into these stuff. Okay, so we got the Domaine Bousquet. So definitely a lighter color. It's more of a straw, but there's a little bit of copper to it. So we got that going on. Of course, all the bubbles. So sometimes the bubbles make it a little bit difficult to see, and we're not necessarily going to be doing blind tasting of, of sparkling wines, but you may have sparkling wines as part of your exam and be able to identify the different methods and the different areas of the world they're coming from. I highly doubt for an advanced exam, I would get a Portuguese one or even an Argentine one, but 
it's good to have that little bit of experience in, in having stuff around from different parts around the world. You're probably gonna have Prosecco, maybe French Accorda, Champagne, Cremant from somewhere in France, uh, Cava, and maybe American Sparkling, you know, that type of thing. You're really looking for method and then what's the typicity of what areas those, those methods can come from. So unlike the Rosé, I don't really get into that red fruit and that's fine. I love, you know, white, you know, or, you know, white wine champagne uh, rather than rosé champagne, just fine. It's really got more of that pear and apple. It's really just pear and apple. Uh, a little bit of lemon, lemon curd, pith. And of course you got that carbonation. So you've got that, that airiness going on. But just like the rosé, there really isn't any of that lees aging or that complexity from the lees. It, it was in the tank. There isn't a lot of lees contact going on. I mean, it's there, but it's not like in a bottle. So yeah, it just smells really clean and crisp. Let's check it out. Oh, this is tasty. I kind of like this better than the rosé from last week or like half hour ago, um, or 45 minutes ago. And even though it isn't high on the RS, oh, it was higher, 9.5, yeah, okay. It is higher than the other one. There's a little bit more sweetness and it's not sweet. So again, like I said last week, there's a balance between sweetness and acidity going on here, but it's a little bit no more noticeable that it's a sweeter wine, but I would not call this a sweet wine. I mean, at nine, if it was 9.2 grams per liter of a red wine or a white wine, it would be fruitier and maybe even sweeter to the taste, but this is just, it, it's got a little bit of extra fruitiness to, to it. It's, it's a green apple, but it's a juicy green apple. It's, it's a ripe green apple. You've also got that Meyer lemon versus just like a really tart lemon. You've got, still got the lemon pith. There's a bit of orange to it, a uh, little bit of the, the pear. You've got that really, really rich and ripe pear going on. It's super tasty. So, little fun fact. When you're drinking multiple wines in one sitting, <clears throat> you actually want to go most expensive or quote best wine to worst wine. Because if you're pounding a lot, you want to you want your full faculties for the most expensive wine or the best wine. And then you're you're just in party mode. Just drink your less expensive stuff. Not, this is excellent quality. I like this wine a lot. But if I was doing New Year's Eve then I would be drinking this one first and then I'd go in reverse order than how I'm tasting. But yeah, super delicious. I mean, this is a great like, or this is like a great like kind of starter wine for like, uh, for like a reception for like a, um, yeah, like, yeah, like a reception wine. It's great. It's easy to drink. It's not, it's not super complex, but it's enjoyable. It's it's, yeah, it's just enjoyable wine. This is like an everyday drinking, this is a daily drinker sparkling wine. Like this style of wine, well, champagne specifically, but sparkling wine, if I could just drink one wine for the rest of my life, this is on the list. Champagne mainly, but sparkling wine would be on the list of the short list of that. This is delicious. I, mean, I can see this like this is definitely a great first course wine if you're doing a, a New Year's Eve dinner. So you're pairing multiple wines. So in this case, yes, I would pair the wines with the proper course. And yes, maybe you start with the least expensive and go to the most expensive because you're only going to get like a small, a small pour of everything. It's good acidity. It's really balanced. The mouth feels good. I'm leaving enough in there. So we're going to compare bubbles and mouthfeel to everything else. All right, let's go to the, um, how, how did I pronounce that again? The, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it right. Dang it, I gotta look it up. Anyway, we're gonna move on to the Portuguese wine as I look up the phonetic spelling for the name of the grape. Goveyu, Goveyu, that's it. Oh. Man, oh, man, I probably should have done this one last. See, 
this is non vintage, but it's champagne, right? And this is vintage. I probably should have done this one last, but man. So it's got that oxidation going on. All right. So it was a scourge, what, into 2016? Yeah, October 2016. So five years ago. So it's got that five years of oxidation plus the other seven years on the leaves. It's not that there was no oxidation at all. It's just that leaves are able to absorb oxygen. But yeah, there's that, oh man, it's got that really nutty characteristic. It's got like this nutty, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, wafers. Like, like, a like you have like, um, those little wafer crackers that were like, like sugar, all sugar, but you don't really smell the sugar, but you got that. But the wafers are made of, out of like some type of almond or, or other nut, like maybe a cashew or a walnut. I think I'm more like a walnut. Yeah. Pecan. There's a little bit of honey roasting there, a little bit of roastedness on, on, on the, uh, on the, on the nuts. Shut up. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness. And then we've got like some candied orange, lemon, green apple. It's, it's all, it's all faint. The, the mixture of nuts is what really comes through with that kind of bit of a caramelization, <clears throat> a little bit of honey, a little bit of roastedness. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I gotta taste this. So yeah, um, there's complexity to this wine. That extra bit of age, besides the fact that, you know, from 2008 through now, so when we're talking uh, freaking 13 years, man, this wine is, I gotta bring this wine to tasting group. Not tasting group, to the theory, theory group next time, next year sometime. Not this bottle, the other bottle. So again, you got that caramelization. You've got that that wafer, that wafer type of cookie with really kind of like a, like a, um, almost like not quite a Nutella, but you've got like a, uh, like an almond paste, a little bit of cherry. There's also a little bit of wood to it. Like, like a mahogany type thing. Caramel apple, green apple, peach, pear, orange, um, 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 a little bit of cocoa. It's like it's like a it's like a a, a a candy that's filled with like a like an orange liqueur. Marzipan. That's what I'm looking for. Marzipan for days. This wine is so complex and so rich. Uh, the acid's there, but it's it's really balanced. And this isn't uh this wasn't a um yeah, it's only four grams per liter, but that acid, that pH is so low, it's balancing everything out, but there's a complexity. There's 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 a broadness to it. That's from the lees aging. You get this extra bit of mouthfeel on it. Like you could really have this with some richer foods, like some rich seafood with with some like like a cream sauce would be great with that. I know I don't like seafood, but I can imagine the pairing. Um, chicken, of course, same concept. Pork, you could even, dude, you could even do like roast beef with like horseradish sauce with that. That would be absolutely killer with this wine. Are you kidding me? Jeez. And it's like 36 bucks normally? Get out of here, man. GTFO. That's a credible wine. All right, Bruno. I have a special place in my heart for Bruno. At least they send me Christmas cards. Um, so I'm really appreciative of that. And uh, so, yeah, I know it won't let me down. I'm just really, I just, I just, I'm using it because, well, I'm, we're going to drink this tomorrow, though I really think we should drink this. But I'll be honest, my friends that are coming over, I don't know if they'll like this wine. I love this wine. So I feel like I really want to bring it like to my, to my peeps. Uh, but I'm not going to see them for like forever. 
So, and the wine won't last forever. So I'll probably have to drink it on, on its own. But Bruno, okay. So it's not as deep. So this one, you see really the, the deeper color. I know it's kind of hard to tell, but this has that deeper golden color. Excuse me while I, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to edit. I'm going to, I'm going to drop the sound real quick. Oh, never mind. Um, this is a lighter yellow golden color, but let's just go ahead and smell it. So yeah. Oh. So this has that freshness. This has some, some white florals to it. Even though my nose is starting to get stuffed up. Of course, you smell, you smell that aeration, the oxidation, the CO2. You got the green apple. A little swirl, maybe aerate a little more. A touch of caramel, but not like this, not like that wine. Not like the, the uh, um, Goveyu. Right? Did I say it right? I did. There's a little bit of that, that cookie, that pastry thing going on, but it's not super prominent. I mean, realize it's not a vintage wine that's going to have that extra, extra, extra lees aging. It's got 36 months, but this one has way more. This is more typical of, even though it's not a vintage wine, it's, it's what, uh, 36 months plus no, six-ish, at least. It was disgorged. It was disgorged, what, June of 2020. So, I mean, it's over a year since it's been disgorged. So it's had almost a year and a half of, of oxidation going on, but nowhere near, nowhere near the Portuguese one. So it's got it there. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like this wine. It's like this, this wine is going to be what this wine will be in like five years, six, maybe six or seven years. It's in between, this wine is in between these two. Okay. Except this one isn't as complex, but it's super easy to drink. Let's just drink this one. Hands down, this is why champagne is champagne. And why champagne, head-to-head, -head, as long as everything else is equal, will typically outperform other wines from other parts of the world, regardless of how the second fermentation happened. Or if it was just like injected CO2, which that's the worst. I don't want that. I don't want that sparkling wine as the wine for the rest of my life. It's got to be at least method traditional, maybe Charmat. I mean, this is really delicious, by the way. So it's got that freshness and that juiciness of fruit. It's got that apple. It's got some pear. It's got some mango. It's got a little bit of tropical fruit going on here. A little bit of pineapple, a little bit of um, orange orange peel, orange pith, uh, but not bitter. And this is super dry. Well, not super, it's like what, under six grams per liter. So that's, it's not as dry as this one, but it's still dry. And this one, th this one, whatever, is richer in, in flavor because of all that aging. This one, I would love to hold on to a non-vintage bottle for like five years, but I, I, I can't. I'm going to drink it. But this is kind of a good, like, winding down wine. So, like, you started with this. And I know you're supposed to go from you know, whatever. You started with that. If you're having a champagne or a sparkling wine dinner, if you're a little appetizer, a little, like, charcuterie, a little reception thing, you're only going to get, like, a little bit, you know, three ounces, whatever. Then you have your main course, okay? And this is, like, this is the big baller, shot collar, is gonna go great with a whole bunch of stuff. And then this is how you wind down. This is like, like, ah, oh, all right. I'm gonna just gonna sit back and enjoy, relax, and drink something that's really elegant and just has great mouthfeel. Oh yeah, I, I wanna need to save some for tomorrow. But what I wanna do is comparison of mouthfeel real quick. So I mean, I already know how this is going to turn out. <clears throat> so these two, same method. And this one, second fermentation in a big tank. Give myself just a touch more of the Verchassi. 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 Anyway, so we're going to do a little mouthfeel test. Wow. You know what's really cool about that? After drinking these really dry ones and the fact that this one has a significant amount of RS, 
it's really refreshing. It like, it's like a palate cleanser. Absolutely like a palate cleanser. But you, you got, you got, you've got the, um, you got the carbonation in there. And then you got that complexity with this. It's rich. The carbonation isn't as prominent. It's more about the flavors at this point. So we're going to compare these two because they're younger, right? All right. So if you're playing the home game, the bubbles or the mousse of this is tighter and more complex. There's, it's like higher resolution. It's like more pixels. Like there's more bubbles in this than this one. This is like 4K and this is like 1080p. They're both excellent quality, which is what you're watching is 1080p, but I record in 4K. So this is like watching my video in the full glory of 4K. And then this is like watching my videos where I downscaled it to 1080p. You still have some excellent quality, but it's not as crisp and as sharp in, in, uh, in the visual. The bubbles aren't as tightly wound, not as much, not as, not as uh, complex, but it's still delicious. Yeah. Anyway. They're all delicious wines, and I'm going to really thoroughly enjoy finishing that, plus these other three wines. Bam, bam, bam. All right. So that's, you know, that's going to do it for the wines. Uh, I hope you have a fun, festive, and safe New Year's Eve this year. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and then tell all your friends until next time. Sorry guys, but you're not sparkling wine. Drink some champagne or drink some Portuguese stuff or drink some Argentine sparkling. I don't care, just drink something. Bruno, we're going with you.